Just two minutes. Hello.
Hi, yeah, hello. Hi. 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 How are you? All good? Yes, can fine. You, yeah, yeah. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah, that's good. So. Yeah, so I think uh, when we start, uh, whoever has any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat box. So at the end of the uh, meeting, maybe what we'll do is we'll uh, try and address all of them. And uh, yes, uh, and yeah, if there are any questions, we'll take them as well. Uh, pertaining to radiographs, uh, we'll try and answer whatever we can. And of course, if anything uh, pertaining to ultrasound, or anything you know, shoulder imaging, we'll try and address those as well. So, uh, yeah, we can uh, can start in some time. Still one more minute. Yes. So let me know when we are ready to start. And uh, good we'll evening, Doctor Ankit. Hi, good evening. Good evening. One we minute. Need to listen to it one more time. Hi, yes. uh, hi, hi. <laughs> I, I won't switch on my video now because I'm in a stupid state. Yeah, that's okay. That's, <laughs> we can hear you. I must I must thank thank you, Ankit, so much for joining today now for giving us the second opportunity to see you. Yeah. Because you know what, Ankit, mm. the other day, you know, we were so like preoccupied with our own talks that oh, we were seeing your amazing. Right. Yeah. We were not totally focused. Mm. So it's a good thing. In oh. fact, I was telling my husband also that you have to listen to Ankit's talk. I mean, you know, you have oh to see God. these x-rays. <laughs> these x-rays, I mean. So he'll yeah. be sitting so with I, I, oh, That's good to know. Uh, so, yeah, I think they're pretty important, at least as far as, uh, you know, ultrasound goes. Yeah. And I, uh, even right now, I feel it's absolutely suicidal to uh, scan the shoulder, at least shoulder, uh, you know, while we're, uh, without having a look at the radiographs. In fact, it makes me very jittery if the patient just walks in without a radiograph still. So Yes, yes. Most of them, most of them without any x-ray. Yeah. They can they say ki our doctor ne dey diya nahi to extra nahi kya bas and so, one more thing your outlet views are so perfect i mean you know ankit i mean i have not taken okay. them in my patients so, ever uh, i should try uh, now uh, instruct I think my radiographers uh, na uh, upasana yes, bar they have done uh, it he's done it so well no, we should, mm, i, I, I am thinking i will try it myself no, no, i am thinking that ankit i will try the x ray myself doing the x ray <laughs> You have to train your technicians. Yeah, to know? Train yeah, train yeah. I should be along with them. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I think uh, we can start. Yes, yes, yes. thank you. I think yes, you can uh, start, that, yeah. that's, that's great. That's great. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining in. Uh, 
you know for a humble talk on uh, you know the humble radiograph of the shoulder now a couple of days back what we had was uh, uh, you know we had a good clinical radiological meet uh, just uh, based on rotator cuff tears and it seems i think people liked it uh, because you know this is something what we face in day to day practice uh <clears throat> so with that let me just start with a case you know this is a a scenario which you know all of us will face at some point of other because you know we say that you know we, once you've gone to the orthopedic surgeon and you know you have told them that you know why don't you send it to me you know i can help you with that uh, maybe you can sh- uh, choose ultrasound over mr you know give it a shot uh, let's see how this works so uh he's just going to send you something uh, uh, you know It's something bizarre. He's not going to care whether you know you're a you're a beginner or you're an advanced level. He wants certain answers. So uh, let's say a case like this. Okay, so this was a 78 year old male with right shoulder pain and restricted movements. He had some history of uh, you know Parkinsonism or dementia, which you know none of us were sure of. Even the orthopedic surgeon wasn't sure of. And he, the orthopedic surgeon, had done a closed reduction for the posterior shoulder dislocation three days ago, and now. uh because the patient was unable to undergo an mr because he was moving too much uh you know they just uh, said that find uh, you know we cannot do the mr why don't you uh, try something else so the shoulder surgeon he sends that okay uh, you know what this was a patient with posterior dislocation i want you to do an ultrasound the first thing you know what we teach in conventional uh, uh, teaching for ultrasound is that you know if it's an internal derangement of joint which is shoulder subluxation dislocations labral injuries ultrasound is really not the uh, uh, not the modality to uh, 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 you know for shoulder but then uh, he tried to convince me he said that all right you know i know he has a dislocation i know he cannot do an mr can you at least tell me whether the subscapularis is intact or not all right that's all that i need to know so i said fine i can tell you that much that should not be a problem so once you start scanning the patient you realize that oh you know what the biceps is really nice and thick you see joint uh, effusion within the biceps tendon sheath this is a long axis where when you see a thick biceps tendon you see complex fluid so which we presume that he had a recent dislocation so this is uh uh this is some kind of a, a hemorrhagic fluid within the biceps tendon sheath the problem starts happening when you see something like this you know when you start going to your bony marker uh, uh, uh bony landmarks that you know i'm not finding the lesser tuberosity hey where's the lesser tuberosity uh why is the glenohumeral joint looking like this i'm not finding the uh, why is the why is there so much of fluid why is the glenoid looking like this i'm not used to seeing the glenoid uh, uh you know so well so uh and then you know you turn to the patient hey where's your radiograph he said uh you know i have the radiograph but it's in the car i didn't bring it i didn't think it was important so i said you know you have to get it because you know without that it's absolutely impossible for me to scan you so in the meanwhile you start scanning the first thing that you see over here is you try and identify your bony landmarks so that's the humerus that's the glenoid that's the cartilage you see the biceps and uh, you know when you do a uh, kind of zoom in this is what starts uh, making sense you scan up and down so that's the biceps that's the subscapularis and that is the anterior joint capsule you do see some discontinuity uh within Excuse the joint me, capsule can... yes uh, yes yes i can't see you uh, yeah? screen yes you can yes okay. now can you see the screen no hello no no we can still see the screen very well you can well. see the screen right okay. yeah i can okay. see something you right. see the screen uncle okay. Right. okay okay it's okay yeah, yeah. i think it's becoming right. i don't know right. something happened yeah, yeah. Okay. all right so, uh, so yeah so this is what we see that this there's a discontinuity in the subscapularis and the capsule but still you know not very convincing you don't know what's happening the next thing what you do is uh, you know go go back and see that you know you realize there's something happening within the joint and this is what you see you're ideally used to seeing the scapula uh, the glenoid and the humerus in one line and uh, but then over here the hu- the humeral head is significantly jutting out uh, that's the infraspinatus okay so that's the scapula i'm not seeing the glenoid rim that's the humeral head that i see and if you look at this is the infraspinatus this is a tendon the tendon is nice and intact uh so by that time the patient has already brought in his radiograph this is a post procedure radiograph and this is what we see uh you see that there is some fracture over here there's an osseous fragment 
But however, since this was a post procedure radiograph, you see the melanese line is nice and intact and everything looks good. There is some calcification, possibly an osseous avulsion injury. We don't know what's happening. And this is a glenohumeral joint, which looks pretty okay. And there's some fracture somewhere. So what are your thoughts? So is this an osseous Bankart's lesion, which is like, you know, a chip from the glenoid labrum since he's had, we know that he has a history of, uh, 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 history of dislocation. Is this a bank card's lesion with persistent humeral dislocation? So, all right, the uh, uh, the radio uh, the orthopedic surgeon has said that fine, I have done my job, but then uh, you know this was a radiograph which was taken three days back, immediate post procedure. But now, what are we seeing? We're seeing some kind of a derangement of the joint. Is this radiograph suggestive of of a massive cuff tear? Or the next thing is, is this a, a hill sacs lesion somewhere? So possibly there's something happening in the humeral head. We don't know. So uh, this is what I would like to start my talk with. You know, we as radiologists, uh, you know, we are good at diagnosing dysplasias, you know, bone tumors. But as far as internal derangement of the joints is concerned uh, uh, and soft tissue abnormalities is concerned, we have some catching up to do because, you know, the... The shoulder surgeons are pretty good at it. And uh, so, uh, you know, and if you're doing ultrasound, you know, uh, X-ray can be a really a good friend of yours and it can help you in a long way. So if you are a beginner, uh, uh, you know, there will be certain pathologies like, you know, massive cuff tears, calcific tendinosis, fractures, uh, you know, severely arthritic shoulders and so on. And this you will be easily be able to pick it up if you have a look at the radiograph, if you know what to look for. And even before putting the probe, you can say, oh, you know what, this patient already has a massive cuff tear or this patient probably has a full thickness tear. So even without putting the probe, you have a rough picture of what you might be getting into. So during the outline of my talk, I will be talking about the radiographic anatomy and positioning. When I tell about uh, talk about positioning, I will be talking about some four basic views, which we uh, use in our day-to-day -day practice almost 99% of the times. So I will not talk about the other nine views. Uh, I will be talking a little bit on calcific tendinosis, uh, how x-rays can help. Uh, you know, I will be discussing radiographic markers, which are pathognomonic for rotator cuff disease, which means there are well-established uh, signs on x-rays, which when you look at it and, you know, you say, you, you know what, there's something wrong with, with the rotator cuff and I should carefully look for it uh, while I'm scanning on ultrasound. And of course, I will be talking about rotator cuff tear arthropathy, which is a, a well-known entity amongst shoulder surgeons. Uh, but then, uh, you know, as far as radiologists go, we most of the times we end up reporting as degenerative changes or osteoarthritis and so on. So uh, let's start with the routine AP view. What we do is the patient is just lies parallel to the cassette. You uh, point at the glenohumeral joint and this is, uh, you take the x-ray. It's good for, to look for overall glenohumeral alignment. You know, you see the nice uh, melanese line over here. Uh, you look at the acromioclavicular joint and the distal clavicle. And like uh, our case, you know, if you would like to see if there's some internal derangement, you can see the posterior glenoid rim. You can see the anterior glenoid rim. And uh, you will be able to see this nice pear shape really well. Uh, next view is this is what you know we have started doing. In fact, we've been doing it for a long time. And this is what the shoulder surgeons or the orthopedic surgeons would ideally want us to do. And this is what ideally we should be giving. So this is known as a true AP view. You can also call it the Grashi's view or the glenohumeral view. In this patient, uh, what uh, uh, in this view, what we see is you see the nice glenohumeral joint space really well. This is a cartilage space. You see the greater tuberosity in an uh, R face uh, uh, view, which is seen as a nice flat uh, structure. And of course, you can uh, easily measure the acromiohumeral much more easily. So in this view, what we do is the patient is asked to stand at an angle of around 35 degrees, uh, you know, to the cassette and the arm in the neutral position. So that in such a way that the scapula is in, is in plane with the, uh, uh, so, so that the X-ray goes in the scapular plane, okay? So the entire scapula is at an angle to the, uh, 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 to the cassette, and that's how we get a nice glenohumeral uh, uh, joint space over here. So this is the true AP view. This is the axillary view. This is a standard view in which, you know, the orthopedic surgeons they ask for AP and axillary views. So this is the anterior part, but in which we look for the coracoid. Uh, this is a, 
uh, this is the acromion, that's the clavicle, and this would be the acromioclavicular joint. So in instability lesions, if the humeral head goes anteriorly, that's the anterior subluxation, posteriorly the posterior subluxation. And of course, you can see the anterior and posterior glenoid rims pretty well. So if you don't know which is, you know, as a beginner, you wouldn't know, you know, which is anterior, which is a posterior, just look for the coracoid, uh, you know, which, whichever side is a coracoid, that's going to be anterior, of course. This is a supraspinatus outlet view. Uh, this is not routinely asked for, but this can be a very useful uh, view to keep in your armamentarium if you're unable to get the axillary view. So what this view shows you is, it shows you the subacromial space. So this is a space, uh, you know, uh, which is uh, uh, formed by the clavicle and the coracoclavicular ligament. So that is entirely the coracoacromial arch. And if there's anything, you know, if there's an osseous spur or if there's a type three, uh, you know, acromion with a hook, if there's an acromioclavicular joint, you know, uh, due to osteoarthritis of the AC joint, if there's a prominent marginal osteophyte, it might be impinging on the supraspinatus. And of course, you can also look at the base of the coracoid uh, over here. That's uh, uh, you know, the coracoid base fractures you can see over here. And if you adjust your windows well enough, you'll be able to see the density of the supraspinatus muscle belly. So these are the things what you can look for a supraspinatus outlet view. So one more thing is, you know, if the patient is in severe pain, you know, when the patient is in trauma, he's unable to do an axillary view uh, because, you know, they won't be able to abduct the arm so much. So this is a good view to take. Uh, they really don't need to do too much of abduction and you'll be able to figure out whether the humeral head is anteriorly dislocated or posteriorly dislocated. So it's, this is uh, something to keep in mind. So this was one 63 year old female with uh, night shoulder pain since uh, two months. You have to realize that each view is going to give you a separate set of information. And, uh, you know, when they ask you just give me one uh, extra shoulder, or maybe, you know, we should try and get one view and let's see which one gives us the best amount of information, maximum in information. So on the true, uh, uh, so on the routine AP view, what we can see is we can see the acromioclavicular joint pretty well, looks like uh, some kind of a, a little bit of acromioclavicular joint uh, osteoarthritis. We see some marginal osteophytes. Over here on the true AP view, what we see is there's some sclerosis uh, at the tip of the uh, uh, greater tuberosity. Uh, and some amount of cortical irregularity. And uh, what we see is there's some reduction in the acromiohumeral distance. So when I look at this, I'm thinking of possibly I'm looking at a rotator cuff uh, tendinopathy or uh, some rotator cuff pathology because there's some superior migration of the humerus mild. And of course, you know, when you look at the outlet view, what we see is this is a type three acromion. You see a hook and this might be uh, a uh, causing a reduction in the subacromial space that we see over here. So uh, once again, just to give you what is the difference between an AP view and a true AP view. So this is uh, your standard AP view wherein the, uh, the patient is standing against the cassette and your x-rays, they pass through the glenohumeral joint through an oblique plane. And this is what you get. And that's the cassette. So that's why you get an oblique appearing glenoid. And this is a true AP view wherein the, uh, the patient is standing at an angle and your uh, 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 and your X-ray beam will pass parallel to the glenohumeral joint. And that's when you get a good profile view of the glenohumeral joint. Okay. So uh, maybe, you know, you will have to teach your technicians to do it, but then this is what we should all be trying to, uh, uh, try, uh, trying to achieve, you know, if you want to uh, make good diagnosis on as far as rotator cuff tears are concerned. There's enough literature when, you know, there was a, a really nice study in the Journal of Shoulder, Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, wherein they said that, you know, the true AP view is more sensitive for detection of pathognomonic findings of rotator cuff tears. You know, they, uh, uh, they checked out the, uh, basically what they did is they compared the routine AP view versus the true AP view. And they said that the true AP view is much, much superior to that. So let's see uh, how this works out. So this is your regular AP view of the same patient. And this is a true AP view with shoulder pain. So what we see over here is, yes, there is reduction in the acromiohumeral distance or acromiohumeral interval. But uh, you see this little bit of rounding of the greater tuberosity, but you're really not sure if there's something happening. So this is the true AP view, wherein we get to see that there is a definite reduction in the acromiohumeral distance. There's a lot of sclerosis over the GT. 
And one more thing, what we can tell the shoulder surgeon is compared to this side, compared to the routine ABD, that you know the glenohumeral joint looks pretty okay. It's there's no significant reduction. So on this two AP view, you can tell it with much more confidence that you, you know what the glenohumeral joint looks uh, pretty normal. Why they need to know this? Because it is going to have a lot of therapeutic implications. That's uh, what we'll be uh, seeing later on in this talk. So uh, in my view, the true AP view that you get is almost uh, is equivalent or it's in the same plane that, you know, when we take the coronal views for MR uh, imaging. Okay, so this is the nice coronal uh, image that, you know, th this is a plane in which we look for rotator cuff tendons. We look at the greater tuberosity. So this is a view that we get, and this is what it looks like on MR as well. So this is in that anatom anatomical plane, the true AP view will show the shoulder in. So this was a 47 year old male with acute shoulder pain since last evening. So uh, this is something like, you know, these are the kind of densities which as, uh, you know, radiologists, if we don't have access to history, uh, you know, we might either pass them off, uh, we might overlook them, uh, we might report these as some uh, uh, control lesion, or maybe we might put these as maybe some query bone island or query calcifications. But, uh, you know, if you're around and uh, you have a history, you might be able to uh, yeah, uh, say that, all right, you know, this is in the location of the greater tuberosity, uh, lesser tuberosity. Let's take an additional view. And this is where, uh, you know, the axillary view is really good. It helps you evaluate the lesser tuberosity. And if there's a calcification in the subscapularis tendon, this is the view that you should be trying to take. Okay. So this was a nice calcification, which was there in the uh, subscapularis tendon. So uh, what does a uh, radiograph show in calcific tendinosis. So what the radiograph will tell you is, uh, you know, if you're taking more than one view, it will tell you the approximate uh, location of the calcium. How big is it? So location of the calcium means, is it in the subscap? Is it in the superior cuff, posterior superior cuff or uh, posterior cuff? Uh, how big is the calcium? How dense is the calcium? All right, so if you see in figure A, the calcium is pretty dense. Figure B, you know, it's kind of partially fragmented. And figure C uh, that we see over here, it's absolutely amorphous. So when you see this kind of calcium, or if you're planning to do some kind of an intervention, uh, you know, you will be able to tell the patient, oh, you, you know what, if I go in, I will be able to aspirate maybe this kind of calcium with, uh, you know, it's going to be a piece of cake. Uh, this kind of calcium, I might be able to aspirate more, most of it. This one, I might not be able to aspirate. What I will do is I will just do some needling and uh, inject a steroid and let it be. But I really can't promise you that I'll be able to take... Uh, take away all the calcium out. But uh, let me tell you that the density of calcium has uh, almost no correlation with the patient's pain. For all you know, this patient might be asymptomatic uh, or minimally symptomatic, whereas this patient might be absolutely, uh, you know, howling in pain and, uh, you know, but be in some kind of a pseudo paralysis. So that is one thing. Uh, about talking about calcium migration, we saw in the talk a couple of days back that what we see is, uh, you know, once the uh, 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 once the pressure within the tendon increases, you have that uh, 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 the calcium kind of, you know, comes out like a toothpaste or a volcano, whatever you might say. So there are two places where it can migrate. Either it can goes along the bursal surface within the bursa. Uh, this is uh, ext uh, extruding within the bursa. This is another calcium which is extruding within the bursa. Or it can also go down within the greater tuberosity or the lesser tuberosity. So this is what happens that, you know, when the, uh, when the calcium has an interosseous extrusion. If you don't know, uh, if you're reporting an MR, you might be able to, uh, you know, you might possibly report osteomyelitis or something like that. Or, uh, uh, because there will be so much of marrow ed edema, it will look like an extremely aggressive lesion. Or if you're doing an ultrasound, you might completely miss this uh, kind of uh, calcium uh, uh, you know, completely, which is within the bone. So this is a case where we, wherein we see this, you know, this is intraosseous uh, calcium. We see that uh, some kind of, you know, uh, calcifications in the region of the humeral head. And uh, this was the MR of the same patient. So this was intraosseous migration of the calcium. That's the calcium within the tendon. And there's over here, we see a lot of marrow edema over here. Uh, just a moment, please. Uh, uh, one moment, please. Yeah. So uh, 
This is another 33 year old male with acute pain in the left shoulder. Uh, on the true AP view, you really don't see much, uh, but then you see that there's some faint calcification happening over here. So what you do is that you try and take one more view with internal rotation. So this internal rotation is really helpful if you if there's calcification within either in the infraspinatus tendon or the teres minor tendons. But then, uh, you know, if there's just one view, uh, you know, as far as you, if you see calcium, you can just label it as calcification uh, uh, within the tendon and that's the end of it. Now, calcific tendinosis is one pathology wherein, you know, an X-ray can be good enough. That's it. You don't need any kind of imaging maybe not ultrasound, not MR at all. It's a self-limiting disease and patient would be fine. So that's the end of the story, okay? So that's uh, why it's important to, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times the patients, they will come with, uh, uh, with an X-ray uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the physician has written that get an X-ray and an ultrasound done. And most of the times what we do is we do an X-ray before the ultrasound and we look at the X-ray and we say, fine, yeah, you know what, it's already calcific tendinosis. So uh, some of the physicians, they would still want the ultrasound to be done. Some of them, they'll say, fine, you know what, let's, uh, uh, let's just, you know, cancel the ultrasound and maybe we'll follow up the patient, uh, uh, you know, how would, uh, and we might do an ultrasound subsequently if the patient doesn't improve. Uh, the supraspinatus outlet view, uh, you know, it's basically for acromial morphology. A lot of shoulder surgeons do ask for it, at least uh, in our uh, area, because, you know, they need to know that, you know, what is the status of the acromion, even if they have done an MR, because on ultrasound, it gives them a better idea. So this is a type 1 uh, acromion, wherein, you know, it's uh, the undersurface is quite flat. This is a type 2 uh, acromion, wherein the undersurface is concave. So most of the acromions are type 2. And there's a type three, which has a hook-shaped acromion. Now, this hook-shaped acromions are associated with, uh, 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 you know, subacromial impingement or bursal surface tears. Of course, there's, it's not a rule, but yes, the, uh, they're more likely to get them. So coming to that, uh, let's move on to rotator cuff tears or tendinosis or pathologies. Now, there are certain markers which are really well established in literature, and we should uh, train our eyes into picking them up and to pick these up, we should, first of all, we should have a good AP view, all right? So uh, we've already spoken about the true AP view. So there are four markers that uh, 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 that are important, and they're pretty simple. I'm not going to give you a lot of, uh, uh, you know, lines and angles because it unnecessarily causes too much of confusion. But then this is what you can, it's quite practical to. So look for uh, inferior cortical acromial sclerosis, all right? So this is over here. This is the inferior cortical acromial sclerosis. This is uh, also known as a sore cell sign, okay? So this is one sign. Look for a lateral acromial spur. So this is one marker for um, a rotator cuff uh, tears. Uh, greater tuberosity, uh, tuberosity cysts or greater tuberosity sclerosis. This is something what we routinely report. A lot of us routinely report this in our day-to-day uh, -day practice and we're quite aware of this. And of course, superior migration of the humeral head. That is one thing I'm going to deal with this separately because uh, superior migration of the humeral head is a different entity altogether. So uh, there's good literature which says that, you know, if you see all the these four signs, you know, together, there's almost 80% a chance that the patient is going to have uh, almost a full thickness tear. So if the patient has come with you with an x-ray like this, even you, without putting the probe, you know that, you know, you're going to be dealing with a full thickness tear. So let's look at each sign individually. So this is an inferior cortical acromial sclerosis, also known as a sorcel sign. This is a sorcel sign. Uh, so uh, I, like I said last time, you know, I just Googled what does sorcel mean, and it actually means like an eyebrow in French. So this is a sorcel sign. So look for this. Uh, lateral acromial spur. This is a lateral acromial spur. In this patient, what we see is there's a lot of periarticular osteopenia, the superior migration of the humeral head. Uh, there is some amount of uh, concavity along uh, uh, the undersurface of the acromion, and there's an osseous spur that we see over here. Greater tuberosity cysts or sclerosis that we've seen quite often. So uh, when I'm talking about superior migration of the humeral head, what I'm saying is, you know, the acromion humeral distance that is between the acromion and the humerus, the distance becomes less than six millimeters. So uh, uh, this is associated with rotator cuff tear arthropathy. 
Okay, so once you see there's a reduction in the distance, you have to start thinking that you know that maybe the patient has a high grade tear of the rotator cuff, and uh, you know he's going into rotator cuff tear arthropathy. Why is it important for you to know this? Because you know if the patient already has a humerus abutting the inferior surface of acromion, if you're going to do ultrasound, you might really not get your markers that easily because you know the GT will be abutting the uh, uh, abutting the inferior surface of the acromion. So you're going to have to struggle a bit with your technique. So rotator cuff arthropathy was described by Neer. So typically what happens is uh, there are three major components of the rotator cuff tear. Once it's going to be a massive cuff tear, wherein there's a large tear uh, uh, within the rotator cuff, of course, there's going to be reduced acromiohumeral distance, and there's going to be some kind of a glenohumeral arthritis that happens over here. Now, a lot of us, we use these terms massive tears, uh, you know, in the rotator cuff. We need to know what a massive tear actually is, all right? We need to know what it actually means in the arthroscopic parlance. Uh, massive tears is basically this complete detachment of two or more tendons, which means most often it is supraspinatus and infraspinatus, or maybe supraspinatus and subscapularis. So there's complete detachment. Or the anterior posterior dimension of the tear exceeds five centimeters. So anterior posterior dim uh, dimension exceeds five centimeters. If you're going to measure from the uh, biceps posteriorly, that means that it, if it's more than five centimeters, that means it's at least involving supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and a part of part of teres minor. Yes, then it's a massive cuff tear. So for this, you need to know what are the pathomechanics mecha pathomechanics uh, mechanics of rotator cuff tear arthropathy. So what uh, the supraspinatus or the rotator cuff does is, you, you know, you you even if you have a full thickness rotator cuff tear, you will still be able to abduct your shoulder. That's not a problem at all, you know, as we've seen a lot of patients. So the deltoid can do a lot of functions. It can cause forward flexion, extension, and abduction as well. What the rotator cuff does is, while the deltoid is uh, pulling the arm superiorly and laterally, what supraspinatus does is it pulls the shoulder in such a, the humerus in such a way that it keeps centered within the glenoid, all right? So this happens in the coronal plane. On the actual plane, if you see the subscapularis and the infraspinatus, they work uh, 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 antagonistically, so uh, or rather synergistically, sorry. So when the supraspinatus, uh, subscapularis uh, contracts, infraspinatus relaxes, or when the infraspinatus uh, contracts, subscapularis relaxes. So what happens is, instead of the humerus uh, going anterior or posterior, it is maintained within the glenoid. So the function of rotator cuff is to keep the humeral head depressed and centered in the glenoid fossa. Uh, so this is what happens. So if you have a tear, if you have a large tear, while the deltoid is trying to abduct the shoulder, what will happen is uh, there will be no muscle trying to restrain the humeral head and it will go and abut against the inferior margin of the acromion. If there's a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and uh, biceps, you know, I'm just giving you an uh, example. What will happen is there will be the humerus, humeral head will migrate anterior superiorly. So this will be, this is what is known as an anterior superior escape. Uh, you know, this is typically seen in patients, and you know, if you try and do them, they'll be able to, uh, you, you will see the shoulder popping out. So this is a patient with a massive cuff tear. That's the glenohumeral joint. The infraspinatus is torn. And what we see is that there's some posterior subluxation happening uh, of the humeral head. So this is what we start seeing in, uh, uh, in massive cuff tears. Now, the radiographic features of rotator cuff tear arthropathy is, you know, we've already spoken, the superior migration of the humeral head. Uh, what you see is there is, uh, you know, due to chronic abutment of the humeral head against the acromion, you start seeing there will be a concavity happening. So uh, you end up getting, along with the acromion, you get, uh, 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 you know, along with the concave acromion and the glenoid, you start, this is known as acetabularization of the glenoid, all right, acetabularization. It starts looking like, uh, uh, you know, it starts looking like an acetabulum. There will be erosion of the greater tuberosity. So over here, if you see that the greater tuberosity has completely remodeled and this looks like a femoral head. So it's going inside and it's almost looking like a femur and then it forms into a concave cup shape kind of a cavity. You will see osteopenia. There's a crystal mediated th theory as well. So what happens is because of the pain, the, pa the patient does not move the shoulder. And then that leads to, uh, 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 that, uh, leads to osteopenia, that leads to reduced flow and so on. And because of the deranged pathomechanics, you will have glenohumeral arthritis as well. So uh, 
what the shoulder surgeons do is they know that there is one uh, classification they use it quite often which is known as hamada's classification and they use it quite often to do some decision making uh, they do it on the true ap radiographs and what the hamada classification does is it represents temporal evolution in cuff tears it tells you at what stage what is happening so there's a stage one where you know the humeral uh, uh, the acromiohumeral uh, interval is maintained so you might just see maybe a, a, a gt sclerosis where in the uh, uh, you know there's no superior migration stage 2 where in the superior migration of the humeral head stage 3 you will see acetabularization now stage 4 is where the glenohumeral arthritis sets in and this is going to be uh, uh, you know this is going to uh, Uh, you know, affect uh, you know what kind of treatment the patient will be offered apart from a simple rotator cuff, uh, uh, you know, a simple rotator cuff repair. And the fifth and last stage is a humeral head collapse. So let's see how the Hamada stage goes. Of course, you don't have to know which stage actually is, but maybe if you know at least it's stage two, three, or four, it's going to be really helpful. Fine. Stage one is pretty simple. Uh, you know, that's you know your acromiohumeral interval is more than six millimeters. Okay. So this is true AP view. Now all this classification is in the true AP view. So this is what we should be doing. So. you see that there's some sclerosis happening over here you see a source of sign the gt looks pretty okay but on the mr you see that there is a full thickness uh, there's a massive tear supraspinatus tendon is torn and infraspinatus tendon is also torn so this is a massive cuff tear but still stage 1 stage 2 is where there's a reduction in the acromiohumeral distance uh, the acrom under surface of the acromion still looks pretty good uh, so this is case 1 where you see the reduction in the distance and over here apart from reduction in the distance uh, you see some there's some kind of a greater tuberosity sclerosis happening over here there's a stage 3 wherein you start seeing acetabularization of the acromion all right so what you see is this is a nice concave uh, margin of the glenoid there's an inferior surface of the acromion so this is a nice uh, acetabulum which is formed and this is for your reference this is what the acetabulum looks like and uh, you see that the there's some uh, remodeling of the greater tuberosity and this looks like you know the femoral head is sitting within the acetabulum so this is acetabularization of the acromion so this is stage 3 now stage 4 is characterized by you know all of that what we said plus the glenohumeral arthritis so if you don't remember stage 4a and 4b that's absolutely fine but if you see superior migration of the humeral head and you see glenohumeral arthritis think of a stage 4 so uh, Uh, uh you know so this is glenohumeral arthritis without acetabularization so this was this new classification uh, 4a and 4b they subdivided and uh, 4b is glenohumeral arthritis along with acetabularization so what we see over here is uh, uh there's a concave under surface of the acromion uh superior uh, migration you see osteopenia you see that there's some amount of reduction in the glenohumeral joint space as well and when you look on the mr what you see is you see a lot of synovial hypertrophy joint effusion and reduction in the acromiohumeral interval and of course there's this full thickness tear that we see another patient similar uh, findings this is 4b reduction in the acro, uh, acromiohumeral distance spur formation uh, gt sclerosis uh, on mr we see synovitis the joint effusion and uh, so on and the humeral head is abutting the acromion completely stage 5 is something what we don't see that often thankfully the patients don't go to that far so what we see is there is a flattening of the humeral head because of avascular necrosis and uh, you see uh, osteophytes as well now this is one stage which you know uh, if you give me this radiograph i don't think i'll be able to differentiate between uh, 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 you know between a uh, glenohumeral arthritis or a neuropathic joint and so on yeah so that's where you know additional imaging features will come in so uh, you know one clue that we see is this reduction in the acromiohumeral interval that we see over here so that's a rotator cuff tear arthropathy stage 5 now if you want to look uh, you know just sit back and say all right i've seen all the five stages so what is the real difference between glenohumeral primary glenohumeral arthritis and uh, rotator cuff tear arthropathy if you see uh, now this patient a has glenohumeral arthritis you see that there is reduction in the glenohumeral joint but most of the acromiohumeral interval is maintained and if you see most of the joint is involved is at the lower side whereas over here you see superior migration of the humeral head and you know most of the joint space which is involved is slightly at the upper end of the sin so this is this rough way that you can uh, you know differentiate between glenohumeral osteoarthritis versus rotator cuff tear arthropathy so uh 
after this we come to post uh, cuff repair imaging it's essential because you know we're doing ultrasound and we need to know what cuff uh, you know what is done what kind of a procedure has been done so uh, some people may, may may use metallic anchors so these metallic anchors over here that's uh, one thing more, more, more please yeah yeah sorry uh sorry for the disturbance so yeah so they either use metallic anchors or you they use bioabsorbable anchors so uh, over here uh, because you know while we're doing ultrasound you're not going to be seeing anchors and you might start searching for them you don't know oh you know where are the anchors gone so this is a metallic anchor yeah it's slightly more deep place they have migrated because of osteopenia so this is what a metallic anchor or a radio uh, dense anchor looks like and these are bioabsorbable anchors you see that you know you won't see those anchors but then if you look at the track uh, you know you look at the operative notes you, retrospectively you will be able to see that so it's very important for you to go through the surgical notes before doing an ultrasound so that at least you know these are the kind of uh, tracks uh, or the anchors which you will be very easily will be able to see on ultrasound as well so uh, what are the kind what are we looking for or uh, what are the markers of maybe you know some kind of complication or you might find something on ultrasound so one thing is you know these are the metallic anchors that we see and there's again there's complete reduction in the acromiohumeral interval for some time you know after the surgery uh, you, you know uh, the acromiohumeral interval is partially replaced but then over here there's significant narrowing so this patient had a, a retear of the supraspinatus tendon infections so uh, 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 you know if the patient has those typical clinical sim symptoms and the patient has been sent to you to look for a collection it's a good idea to look at the radiograph so what we see is this is a metallic anchor and you see that there's some kind of you know uh, lysis which is happening around the anchor so even without putting the uh, probe at least you know that you know you're going to see a lot of gt irregularity and maybe you might expect something over here and of course there's a lot of reduction uh, there's a lot of uh, you know increase in the glenohumeral uh, and acromiohumeral interval uh, and there's some amount of subluxation also happening which might point towards a lot of uh, a large uh, joint effusion as well uh, this was another patient uh, you know with again with infection you see some lysis in the gt and what you see over here is you know the anchor has completely dislodged so uh, let's see i would have started scanning this patient even without looking at the radiograph i see I, you know i start wondering what this is what this is there's no way that you know i could tell the orthopedic surgeon with confidence that hey you know what the anchor has come off unless you show him this picture so that's when uh, that's where radiographs are pretty useful now uh, coming back to management of rotator cuff tear arthropathies it depends at what is the age of the patient and what is the functional demand of the patient and how bad is the tear okay so uh, you know uh, for rotator cuff tear arthropathies if it's a complete uh, uh, you know first what they will try and do they will try and do a complete rotator cuff tear repair they'll try and bring the cuff back and they'll try and put it at the footprint and they'll repair if the patient has a low physical demand they're not doing really much work not much uh, driving just being at home they might try and bring the cuff back and maybe repair it at the edge of the greater tuberosity or maybe on the humeral head but then the amount of uh, you know functional uh, capacity will be reduced sometimes you know they might say uh, uh, you know they might feel that you know the cuff has you know torn and gone too medially which is stage 3 beyond the clinoid they cannot pull it back because you know if they pull it back it's going to be a high tension repair and it might just end up tearing so what they do is you know between the cuff and the greater tuberosity they put a graft they might either use a facial ultra graft or maybe they might just put a skin graft or maybe a synthetic graft and what they do is they put that graft over here and they kind of make a make a partition so that what happens the humeral head doesn't go and abut against the uh, abut against the acromion and this is uh, shown to cause uh, you know alleviation of the pain and of course uh, you know the last resort is tendon transfers which in you know uh, they talk about uh, transfer of latissimus dorsi and pectoralis major tendons but this is not something that commonly done instead what has come into fashion is you know they start doing reverse shoulder arthroplasties when what they do is they have completely completely replaced the geometry for in so in a normal shoulder what you have the glenoid is the cup and the humeral head is a ball so what they do is uh, they replace it in such a way that the glenoid becomes the ball and the humeral head has a cup so this is your reverse shoulder arthroplasty and 
for this uh, uh, the, this kind of uh, surgery is typically done for patients who have irreparable or massive cuff tears. The only requirement what the surgeon needs is the patient should have a functioning deltoid muscle. So that is one thing they need to have. Uh, the patient should have a good deltoid contraction because then this kind of uh, uh, surgery is going to happen only when the deltoid is functioning. So this is typically indicated in populations more than 65 years uh, uh, older with low functional demand. Uh, irreparable cuff tears and patient with ad advanced rotator cuff tear arthropathy. So typically for stage four, because you know they will have to address the glenohumeral arthritis as well. Because in stage four, if they just repair the cuff and you know they don't address the arthritis, the patient is going to come back to them. But now uh, you know the indications are also changing, and a lot of people have started doing re reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So that's where it's really important. So uh, to conclude. Uh, you know, the radiographs can be indicative of underlying rotator cuff pathology. So they can tell you a lot of stuff. So uh, especially for us doing uh, x-rays, uh, I mean, ultrasound x-rays are going to be really, really helpful. I would advise or maybe, you know, uh, kind of push you guys, you know, to start doing true AP views or the Grashi's view, because, you know, uh, that's really uh, what is expected out of us nowadays. Uh, Evaluation of radiographs prior to a shoulder ultrasound is absolutely rewarding. You should see if you, uh, if the patient doesn't have, there's really nothing that you can do. But if you have a, uh, uh, if you have a tough case, you really don't know what's happening, and you have a facility of an X-ray. Uh, I really think uh, there's no harm in taking that one extra, uh, extra uh, X-ray because you know that's going to really make a, a lot of difference to the patient. See, at the end of the day, the surgeon is really not asking you to make a diagnosis of rotator cuff tear or tendinosis. He's asking you for an answer. If your report is going to uh, address all his questions, then yes, you're the, uh, you're the king for him. And you know, you're going to be getting a lot of work that way. And uh, rotator cuff tear arthropathy has a lot of distinct uh, imaging findings. And uh, yeah, so we should know what a rotator cuff tear arthropathy is. And we, uh, you know, apart from just labeling it as arthritis or osteoarthritis or degenerative changes, you should go ahead and we should uh, try uh, and maybe report it differently. So, uh, you know, coming back to our case, uh, you know, so this was this immediate post-procedure radiograph. And uh, what uh, and between those three days, you know, when after it was reduced, uh, so uh, uh, after doing the scan also, so this is what we think that, you know, this is an osseous bank arts lesion. There's some chip coming from some place. There's a bank arts lesion with humeral dislocation. So bank arts lesion, yes, we picked up something on the x-ray. Looking at the, uh, you know, that ultrasound, which I had shown, you see that uh, humerus has completely popped out. So at least this is what I can confidently tell the, uh, uh, tell the orthopedic surgeon that you know there's a re-dislocation but then for re-dislocation is can be a, a slightly tricky thing uh, to tell the orthopedic surgeon based on ultrasound alone so this is what you do we uh, repeated a radiograph and this is what we see that you know there's an overlap of the uh, uh, of the humeral head over the glenoid. Now, this is something we don't know. Is this an anterior dislocation? Is this a posterior dislocation? This could be anything. Having said that, you know, but we've already done that ultrasound. We've already seen that humeral head popping out. So we know that, yes, this is a, uh, uh, this is a, a posterior dislocation of the humeral head and it's kind of, you know, impinging over the glenoid. There's something happening over there. So, and if you look at this, you know, the Melanie's line immediately post-procedure was quite intact. And over here, the, that melanin line has been broken. Okay, so this is what we see over here. So uh, just to confirm that you know what I'm seeing is correct, what we do is uh, go step back before you again start doing the scan. Do ask a patient to do a little bit of external rotation. So on the right side, if you see that external rotation is lost. Now external rotation can be lost in three uh, pathologies. One is glenohumeral arthritis. Second is when there's posterior dislocation of the shoulder. And three, something more important, what we see more commonly is your frozen shoulder. Now we already know that this patient has had a posterior dislocation. So it's most likely that the patient has had a posterior dislocation again. And uh, yeah, this kind of uh, tells me that yes, we're dealing with a posterior dislocation. Uh, so this is what we see. And on, on the dynamic scan, when he's trying to do uh, external rotate, the humerus is not really rotating, but then it's just kind of moving out. And this is a subscapularis. You see that there's a full thickness tear over here. There's a tear in the joint capsule as well. And uh, the glenoid is, uh, you know, the glenohumeral uh, alignment looks is looking pretty funny. 
And when you evaluate the patient from the posterior aspect, uh, this is what you see that, you know, uh, the humeral head is kind of impinging over the glenoid rim and uh, uh, kind of, you know, there isn't really much external rotation happening over here. So by now, by looking at it, I know that this is a subscapularis tear with the tear in the anterior joint capsule. And uh, uh, just to make sure that, yes, so I already know there's a subscap tear. And what I do for confirmation is ask the patient to do a belly press test. So this was a contralateral side. He's able to do a belly press test. But then on this side, what he's doing, now this is what he's doing is a little bit of cheating. He's just pressing. But then when you ask him, he's unable to do the belly press test. So this is one sign, all right? You ask the patient to just press the belly. If the patient is unable to do a belly press test, that means, you know, the patient has, has a subscapularis tear. You know, the subscapularis is not functioning. So the ultrasound findings are this posterior dislocation of the humeral head with engagement uh, along the posterior glenoid rim. There's a full thickness subscapularis tear with osseous avulsion of the lesser tuberosity. So that fragment that we were seeing was from the lesser tuberosity. And there's full thickness tear of the supraspinatus. And of course, tendinosis of the long head of biceps. Uh, in his setting, the orthopedic surgeon might not really be too interested in. So next thing, what you do, you ask for a, a CT. And this is what CT is really going to help you. It, it will show you the bone loss. It shows you the, and the alignment of the humeral head along with the uh, glenoid. And this is what we see, that this is the humeral head a large reverse hill sacs lesion and it's kind of Im impinging so that's why you know the patient is unable to do any kind of uh, an external rotation and this is what the 3d ct shows there is posterior dislocation you see that fragment over here it's coming out from the lesser tuberosity so uh, the ct findings are going to show posterior redislocation uh, with uh, engagement of the humeral head along the posterior glenoid rim and there's a large uh, reverse hill sacs lesion in the humerus and of course fracture of the posterior glenoid rim so this is going to tell the surgeon that, okay, you know what, I need to uh, now go ahead and fix the subscapularis, because if I don't fix the subscapularis, it's, uh, you know, this patient is going to have a dislocation at all. So, uh, yeah, I think this brings an end to my talk. If there are any questions, uh, you know, I'll be happy to answer if there's anything. Yes, uh, I will put them it's in the box. So, yes. so good, Dr. Oh, Ankit, it you. was so good. And I have learned so many things I, and I definitely I will try to bring out such yes. type of extra. I don't know I will be able or not, but I'll try to do it. Great. That's, and uh, Nidhi Ma'am has joined Anki, Galaxy yeah. Note as Galaxy yes. Note, can you? Galaxy Note, yeah, okay. One more, one moment, please. Um, yeah, just a moment. I have made her the co-host, yes. Hi, Anki. Yes, hello, ma'am. Hi. Hi, lovely, yeah. absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank so you I just had yeah. I just had one question mm -hmm. that when you say when you say that we take um, AP view, would mm -hmm. you suggest? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So would you suggest? Would you suggest that we take both the shoulder X-rays? I mean, in one view, both the shoulder joints. Uh, it might not be possible because you know if you have to take both the shoulder joints in one view, the patient will be uh, will end up uh, you know standing uh, kind of parallel to the cassette. Where in this mm -hmm. side, if I'm trying to do a uh, two AP view, I will be like mm -hmm. this. If I'm trying to do a shoulder, I will be doing like this. So if you're trying to get both the views, then it it might not happen that way. Both I was shoulders. I was just thinking that in early stages where you said grade one, grade two, mm. and we have a little bit of confusion because you have that yes. osteitis, a bit of flattening of the yeah. GT, sclerosis, yeah. and you want to yes. find out. So yes. if we have both the views, maybe it would help us to understand better. That was yes. just one more thought. That's all. Yes. yes. But uh, yeah, I guess AP view is something where uh, I would just like to make one comment. Usually what happens yeah. is that when the patient is standing and you're seeing that x-ray, you're not very sure. So it's just mm. that the anterior and the posterior margins of the glenoid should overlap. Yes, That's when yes. you know that yeah. it's a true AP. Yeah, Sometimes so we it should, comes otherwise also. Yeah so, we should, uh, yeah, so we should try and get that as, I mean, you might not always get that uh, perfect view, but at least we should try and achieve that as much as possible. Absolutely. So it's just yes. that, you know, uh, then all your measurements about having the acromiohumeral interval and everything, all that will fall into place. You will be able to do it much more confidently than what is actually, uh, uh, you know, on the 
maybe you can try it tomorrow you know when you go just take a routine ap view and try and see measuring the acromion humeral interval a lot of times you might feel it's normal but when you do a true ap view it really comes out well even the evaluation of uh, gp sclerosis now uh, having said that this calcific tendinosis can be absolutely uh, uh, you know tricky because i i know it, that one view is not always sufficient it might not tell you always you might need one extra view but then uh, you know if it's strongly suspected or uh, you know if you have a patient who's come for uh, an ultrasound as well as this it might well uh, might as well take one extra view after doing the ultrasound if you pick it up on that no i'm going to requote what you said about the shoulder and the elbow Sorry. people because yes. they say that when they are evaluating rotator cuff on a shoulder mm -hmm. they want mm -hmm. to actually take three views instead of one yes yes they yes, said three do. views and when they practically yeah. take those three views and that's yes. when they say that we can say on shoulder that's a rotator yeah. cuff yeah. but amazing i'm very yeah. glad upasna thank, thank you. you very much for organizing it thank you ma'am yeah <laughs> so uh, well done. Yeah. yeah so you know we should we should as radiologists know that you know the orthopedic surgeons they still love their x rays you know if you go to the meetings and you know, they will say that you know even if you put up uh, you know some of the colleagues which i think you know look at this ultrasound you know this is why got this nice finding they say after pehle x ray dikha for show me the x ray then we will go ahead and we'll talk about everything else yes. so I they, many hey, patients, they don't want yeah. to do it okay they just come straight to the ultrasound room yeah. without any x ray and they said ki doctor sahab ne diya nahi to kyun karna hai x ray right. i think so Hey, hey, always another yes. thing that Ankit, I want to say is that if you have a true AP view, you can mm. very well comment on the status and the thickness of the articular mm. cartilage also. You can yes. actually see the fibrillation yeah. Yeah. in grade yes. two, grade three. Yeah, mm -hmm. even grade three, you can see that articular fibrillation, the cartilage um, mm. loss, irregularity, which is uh, quite yes, amazing with the true AP. Yeah. And, yeah. and this is going to have a bearing on the patient's management. Of course, they will do some advanced imaging, but at least yeah. they'll be able to say that, all right, you know, that Hamada's classification grade four, uh, this patient might not be, uh, you know, it might not be enough only to do a rotator cuff repair. We might need yeah. to do something else as well. Uh, well Absolutely. Maybe offer some kind of an uh, uh, a replacement or something. But there is so, one pitfall, and I don't know if you yes. agree with yeah. me or not, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. when, we have, when we have a paralytic patient, Yeah. Okay, so yeah. upper limb paralysis and early, mm. the acromiohumeral distance can sometimes falsely be increased yes. and yes. appear yeah. normal, even though you yes. have a rotator cuff tear sitting there. Yes. So yeah, actually you have a point. So even in uh, uh, you know patients with large joint effusions, voluminous uh, effusions, yeah. you know, you yes. see that it there's a significant increase in the. in the acromiohumeral distance in the glenohumeral you feel that it's all subluxated and so on so absolutely yeah so, so I, i think yeah that combination uh, with ultrasound or additional imaging yeah. with uh, so x ray has its value a lot of value okay, absolutely. and uh, uh, and i think i think the greatest value is in differentiating whether sometimes you can feel that there are cortical defects which are actually just irregularities of osseous changes there mm -hmm. then of course the acromion then uh, yeah. you know so all in all it gives great bony landmarks and of course yeah. you've done a fantastic job of bringing it forward absolutely you, wonderful yes. i'm going to leave with some other questions if are there i'm not going to hog the time yeah so if yes. there are questions yeah. please hello. do write in hello ankit yes hello 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 yes, ankit yes, yes. Hi. a great talker thank you so yes. much for Hi. taking this uh, yeah. repeat session for us we missed Hi. that day's session and yes. one thing i wanted to ask Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, yes. uh, routinely uh, orthopedic surgeons specifically ask for true AP view. Yes, in, yes. In certain yes. cases, we go for it. Otherwise, yes. what is your advice if patient is coming for AP lateral? Mm -hmm. A physician must may be mm -hmm. asking, or a general practitioner, or maybe ortho. Do you mm -hmm. recommend to take additional true AP view in good. for all the patient AP no. lateral? So, so good question. So in our practice, what we do is AP view means a true AP view. Uh, uh, see. ultimately you have to realize that even if a physician is sending it to you subsequently the patient might land up with an orthopedic surgeon so he's going to carry your x-ray over there so if you're doing it so a true ap view this is what we do uh, we always uh, do we try and get the true ap view as far as possible and uh, as far as lateral view we do an outlet view so true ap view is a ap and lateral is at outlet view so 
yeah that's what we do so uh, so if you're taking you, an ap view get a true ap view this is what we follow in okay. uh, practice yes. thank you ankit so much yes yes all right pleasure so thank you all for joining in you know on the sunday evening yes and uh, yeah i so i think you know see anyways uh, as far as ultrasound is concerned see we do agree that you know shoulder is a tough joint to scan you know compared to other joints so you're getting that little bit of extra help from the x ray so you might as well take all that help that you're getting and let me tell you shoulder is difficult for everybody it's even difficult for orthopedic surgeons a lot of orthopedic surgeons you know there will be a lot of people doing uh, knee arthroscopies Uh, but there will be very few people doing actually shoulder arthroscopies I, i mean compared to the number of people who do knee arthroscopies so yeah it's uh, it's not that you know everybody knows everything we are learning yeah okay all right thank, thank you, you so, so much. much thank you thank you thank you everybody for joining in uh, it was a pleasure yes if there's anything I'll definitely uh, any queries let me know thank <laughs> you Yes. I'm definitely going to do these things, and I'll yeah, show it to you. Sure, sure. <laughs> you have to check yes. whether it is yes. fine yes. or not. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank Upasna, you. Upasna, two, yeah. two days. Upasna, two days case which you had put up. If the X-ray was done, I think probably there was no need for the rotator cuff. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know? That was. Yes, I asked, yes. I asked so him to do that the... X-ray. Even that ah, yeah, patient yeah. was so, also without X-ray. Pa- yes. Patient came without X-ray, right? Yes, sir. Patient came yes. without yes. X-ray. Yeah. Without okay, X-ray. Okay. Yes. I thought, which is very unusual, you know, that in the yeah. pediatric yeah. age group, the first investigation start, usually uh, that is. Uh, yeah. They start believing in ultrasound. I think yeah. more than X-ray. Yeah. <laughs> I think so, sir. <laughs> no, 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 no. Orthopedic, you know, the orthopedic surgeon love X-ray. Yeah, they no. they will ask for the X-ray. I don't believe. I don't know, sir. X- I except to... in you know cases like a. Uh, Yeah, there are certain no like frozen shoulder. They will do after the clinical examination if they feel his shoulder. They will just do one plain X-ray for a medical legal purpose or something. But they yeah. will not do any additional investigation unless they 